The world is like a ride at an amusement park. And when you choose to go on it, you think it's real, because that's how powerful our minds are. I can tell you from experience, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. Don't think. Feel. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Hey brothers, welcome back to the Liberation Mental Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Gargarides, and we've got an amazing show for you today. Today's show is an absolute firecracker. I have my friend Mike Cernovich on, who is a powerful man, a very often misunderstood individual, and just generally a wonderful human being. And the show goes deep. We speak about bullying and, and what it does to people. And Mike shares his story of how he was mercilessly bullied and how he overcame it. And uh, it's just a wonderful show. One of one of the best ones I've done in a long time. I really enjoyed it. And I know you guys are going to get a hell of a lot out of it. Speaking of getting a lot out of things, I just want to remind you guys that I am still taking on coaching clients. And uh, if you're a man who knows that it's time, it's time to step up and make some major changes in his health, wealth, or relationships, or all three of those. If you know you're not fulfilling your potential and you want to just break through to the next level, I strongly recommend that you book a call with me. I've been getting my clients great results. Head over to my website, liberationmentor.com, and click on coaching, and then click on testimonials, and you'll see just some of the kinds of results I've been getting with uh, or for the men I work with. And uh, I'll give you a coaching session with me that will change your life for sure, and you can decide if that's something you want to pursue further or not with absolutely no obligation. I truly enjoy those calls. It's just a chance for me to get to know my listeners as well. So as I said, you're under no obligation. If you have some areas in life that you're stuck at or, or things that you want to find a fresh perspective on, just book a call with me and we'll we'll have a, a fun and interesting conversation. Okay, guys, let's dive into the call with Mike Cernovich. This is an amazing one. Enjoy. Hey, brothers, I'm here with a longtime friend, someone I don't get to see anywhere near as often as I like. But uh, I know he's one of the best people around with a, a great heart, and I really wanted to have him on the show for a while. It's Mike Cernovich, author of The Gorilla Mindset. Mike, thank you for making the time to come and speak to me today. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's good talking to you. I think the last time we did a podcast was about four or five years ago. Sure. It was in Westwood in LA, right? Yeah, yeah, at that coffee shop. That was, I remember that. Our, life is, our lives have definitely gone. <laughs> Amazing what five years where your life can go. I'll just say that. It's true. And then I find that 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 idea really exciting that, you know, if you if you set a course of action and commit yourself totally, you can completely change your life in as little as five years. One of uh, my mentors who's a very, very successful human being, he says he plans everything in five year blocks. He says if you want to get something done really well, like set aside five years for it. I find that quite interesting. Five years, that's a, that's a good time block, attainable. Ten, ten years is like completely unpredictable. That's why that's when I deal with like a lot of the younger guys. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I'm 21. You know, what's my like life vision? I go, well, so unrealistic that we expect people when they're in college to somehow have a life course. I wish somebody had just told me that, your life, especially now because everything is much more dynamic, Mm -hmm. You might think you have a life course, but if you don't have one, it's okay. It's okay yeah. to not have a life purpose, especially at a young age. Yeah, and often very, I find very often that the people who have known about their purpose since they were like 12 end up being pretty fucking boring because they're so one-dimensional and they've had blinkers on for so long that um, you know there's nothing really much more to them except their, their career. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you've met a bunch of people like that. And the fact that... Um, Everyone who knows you knows you're quite a controversial guy, and um, we'll get into some of those the reasons for that. But um, I guess the the career that you've kind of pivoted from, I guess, is um, you were out in um, you were in the political scene in the United States in D.C. doing a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, some people claim that you were a member of the alt right. I know you resist that label, but either way, I'm just interested to know what it was like there in, in the heart of the beast. You spent what like a couple of years out there in D.C. Uh, working out there and, and basically journaling and documenting what happens out there. Is that right? Yeah, I've spent a 
and been the belly of the beast. I mean, at the highest levels, the, you know, the White House press corps broken some of the biggest stories by, I mean, by any objective measure, you know, made a member of Congress resign for sexual harassment and play, you know, played the game at the highest level. And I noticed though, that I aged probably, I don't know, five years and three, because <laughs> the energy out there is so toxic in a way that's, hard to describe unless you've been in it. There's these vibrational forces that affect you. It's why the uh, DC very high drinking um, journalists is actually very, very high drinking and, and drug use and drug abuse mm. because of all that toxic energy all the time. I didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, Mike, I don't know about you, but my whole thing is I just don't understand the draw of politics. I never have. I mean, I know it's, it's a necessary evil in the modern world, but you know, there's that expression, anyone who wants power shouldn't have it. And to me, there are definitely things that I want in life. There's no doubt about that. But power, I've never really understood that. I mean, as long as I have freedom, I don't need power. I don't, that just doesn't make sense to me. Why would I want to control someone else? Or why would I, I find that that's a very, it usually reveals a very deep character flaw, the desire for power. And I'm sure you saw a lot of that firsthand. Yeah, the entire culture is based around what can what can you do? What have you done for me lately? Which is the everywhere too, of course, mm -hmm. but at a level and intensity, maybe uh, outside of finance would be the only the only close example. Yeah, it just doesn't sound like my idea of a good time. You know, the the Machiavellian like maneuvering and all the backstabbing and the, I don't know, man, it's just to me that, that, as you said, you use the word vibration and I appreciate that because it's, it's the whole energy involved in it. Do, do you really want to live your life like that? And I know there are some people that like and enjoy that. I'm just, I'm not one of them. I'm not, I'm not wanting to fucking, uh, you know, that expression, don't, don't wrestle with the pig because the pig likes it and you just get dirty or something like that. It's, to me, it's like, why would you want to go taint yourself with that energy? And I'm, it sounds like you figure that out. Well, the issue too, though, is if you don't do it, then you fill the vacuum is going to be filled by other people who do. And that's why we have this constant contradiction where, and this isn't you because you, you, you seem to not be one of these people, but you know, a great number of people talk about all these problems and then they want to avoid getting into the muck and mire. You're going mm -hmm. into a sewer. It, really, there's no other way to put it. You're going deep into a sewer and you're going to have shit and puke all over you and that's a terrible job it's a dirty job if we don't do it though then someone else will and the kind of people who are doing it and again this is both political parties this is not unique to one side are going to be evil and they're going to do things like start massive wars and you know bomb people and mm. get engage in all the sociopathy and, and psychopathic behavior sure well dude i'm just glad you're out of it <laughs> i never yeah. i like always like i was kind of worried that there was at one point where I thought I'd, I'd lost our friendship because you you just fucking been drawn into that and that was like your new thing and and I was just thinking yeah we're both on just such different uh, trajectories and we're both in such different I don't know like uh, worlds that 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 was going to be the end of our friendship and I'm really glad you you kind of have taken a step away from that because truth be told I think you're better than that man I think that your your skills and your gifts are can be much more useful in, in other spheres in, in, in the world. Well, it was good to, to show people that I was a complete political outsider. Again, when we, when we talked four years ago, cause I like you, I, I frankly, and I'd written this, I I'd said people who are involved in politics are pretty much losers who have given up on their own lives. And to some degree, there's a lot of truth to that. You meet people who expect solutions from other people and they become very entitled and very nasty when it doesn't happen because they're not, they're not doing deep work on themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so four years ago or whenever, five years ago, we, we talked, I was completely out of the game, but that said, I've always been somebody who I, I like challenges. I like to go into new worlds where I can play a game and play it at the highest level. And I went into the medium political world and by any objective measure, played it at the highest level. And now I can come back and I'm just going to the gym, doing bro stuff again, That's great. taking pre-workouts. Do, you're doing the kind of stuff I was doing maybe when I was, except I have children now. So mm -hmm. I'm more balanced and integrated, but my priorities now are 
just been, you know, getting my body back in shape. And, you know, cause you, you remember, right? I used to be quite jacked and mm. I'm certainly, certainly not now, but <laughs> I've been training hard. The muscle memory is good. So I'm, I'm nice. gaining back quickly. Yeah. That's good to hear, brother. I'm, I'm really happy to have you back uh, on the light side. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little bit about, this is quite a big issue and I almost didn't want to bring it up with you. And, you know, I cleared it with you before we started the actual show. So um, I'm not so worried about it anymore, but you know, you were, you were someone who was bullied quite a lot when you were a kid by your own admission. And I think a lot of, a lot of men deal with that. I dealt with with a little bit of it, not a huge amount, but there were definitely certain periods where I've, I got like what I like to consider the short end of the stick in, in junior school and high school. And, you know, I'd love to know, like, you're obviously not someone like that anymore. You've, you've superseded that and you're someone that people look up to and you've got a good social circle. And how did you overcome that? What was, what were the keys that you used to, to overcome the, the obvious scars and, and trauma that that left you with? Yeah, no, I've, I've talked quite openly about bullying and I would, I just, you know, drew a, I drew a bad number in life. There was uh, naturally like of the fat kid growing up, although mm -hmm. this is why I have complicated views on, you know, the obesity epidemic in America is I was the fat kid growing up and my brothers was skinny and we didn't really have a lot of food at home. So I didn't, I wasn't starving or anything, but you, you weren't getting like seconds and we didn't have little Debbie snack, snack cakes or the other kind of things people would bring to school. Mm -hmm. And I was just like chubby. So when people claim there's no fat gene, I'm like, well, I mean, I, I mean, I was chubby since like I was five years old and we didn't really have that much food. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know. But that said, when you look at kids now, like the fattest kid when I was growing up was, which was me was, is like in the medium now wow. I, I would be. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can see that there is. So that, that's a bit of a digression, but you know me from, you, you know, every time we talk, I, I digress in a lot of different ways. Uh -huh. I love it. And so, yeah, I, I, so I hit the, the, the lottery of being like naturally the fat kid and poor, which is just uh, creates a whole backdrop of, of stress mm -hmm. that, you, you know, you don't realize. So, you, you know, grow up in kind of a nasty house, a dirty house. And that you also grew up around other poor people, which mm -hmm. I forget where I read this, but they said the worst part about being poor is you have to live around other poor people. <laughs> and and yeah. that's true. Poor people, your bike is going to get stolen if you, if you can afford a bike. Mm -hmm. And poor kids are, they, their parents tend to not supervise them. So you're, you're getting into fights. Uh, people, the bullying um, is going to happen. Bullying happens amongst all socioeconomic classes, mm -hmm. but it certainly is going to happen with the lower classes, especially because a lot of poor people tend to come from um, abused homes. Luckily, that wasn't me. I had a, a great uh, dad. He just was a religious freak and <laughs> didn't care about money. It's like, well, great. Uh, you know, he had that, the intersection of the boomer mindset with, uh, you know, Christianity, spiritual mindset, which boomers are very self-centered, as you know, even if you have good parents, you can, there's a, a high degree of narcissism in that entire generation. So we had the great overlap of, oh, I'm fine. I don't care if I'm poor. It's like, well, I don't, your kids might care though, maybe. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. maybe wanna, and, and I don't want to breach privilege, but you know, we've spoken, I think about your, you know, your father before too, and we won't go there if that's not something you, you know, you've spoken openly about. No, I, I can happily speak about it. I'm pretty open about it. He'll probably end up listening to this at some point. Um, yeah, my dad <laughs> listens to my stuff too. And yeah, I think cool. because boomers are so narcissistic, even if you're criticizing them, um, as long as you're talking about them, they think it's pretty. <laughs> it could be, it could be. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah, I guess you know, if I look back to my childhood, as I said, I wasn't bullied a huge amount, but there were a couple of periods where, yeah, I was a chubby kid at one point and, you know, like I had a funny sounding surname that no one could say. And <laughs> there were, you know, it's like I remember arriving at this, at the, the kids used to hang out at the skateboard ramp near the school. Like everyone would go there like on weekends and just hang out there and smoke cigarettes, you know, like dumbass things young kids do. And I remember arriving there one day and this was like, this dude, he was such a douchebag. If, uh, if I ever saw him now, I'd probably slap his face just for the hell of it. Um, as I'm sure you've, you've had experiences like that when you've run into these dudes who've bullied you years later. And now that you know how to box and you're a big, strong guy, it kind of like changes the dynamic entirely. But I remember he, he just walked up to me and he just said, 
no one wants you here, man. Why, why are you here? No one likes you. And I just remember thinking, I don't even know you, dude. <laughs> well, why, why, like, why are you doing this? And looking back, you know, I, I was bullied. But then if I'm honest with myself, I bullied a couple of people as well. And if I look back, I realize it was just me paying it forward, right? Because that's what happens, right? Like that kid probably bullied me because he had some shitty home life or some older brother had bullied him. And then I take, I absorb that energy and then I go bully someone else. And then it just becomes this perpetual like chain of bad karma or bad energy. Right. Oh no. I'm glad, I'm glad you bring that up because yeah, I, I had a similar thing where I grew up and it's amazing how these stories are archetypal mm-hmm. and, you know, like I was the proverbial, you know, proverbial, even in the sense of it's an archetype, it's a common story or not a common story, but it's idealized like the karate kid or whatever. Mm-hmm. As I'm a poor fat kid. And I think it was before third grade, I was hanging out with my childhood best friend and then he just started like beating me up. And at first I thought he was like play hitting me or something. And I had no real comprehension of what was happening. I literally couldn't, couldn't comprehend what was happening. Like, wait a minute, he's beating me up. And I I was third grade. So I think I was crying. And two of the older kids had told him that he couldn't be my friend anymore. And that he had to like beat me up. (laughs) Yeah. And kids it was, are mean, man. Kids yeah, are so mean. We were, we were just, we were at the, I'm laughing now, but I mean, at the time it was quite traumatic because <laughs> we were at, um, you know, where I grew up, like it was kind of like your free range kids, mm-hmm. which had two sides to it. One is there's no adult supervision. You had a lot of freedom, but two is there are places then you couldn't go anymore because the kids who are bullying you are going to be there and there's no, nowhere to run, nothing to do. And it's like, what, you know, why is this guy's my best friend beating me up? So he beat me up. And then he beat me up again at school. That was at the weekend before I think school started. And then he beat me up, <laughs> beat me up again. I'm like, okay, this is, you know, this is really, really terrible. And and when you when you go back and you reprocess what had happened, you realize when you're a kid, you don't know how to process what is happening. Like there there was no concept of at least then when I grew up, like I'm being bullied. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is going on you just know that your life is like terrible and everywhere you go you have to watch your back Mm -hmm. and it was um i mean quite bad so i my number i just always say like my number was up there i was the the kid that people bullied and then i started um training martial arts taekwondo with my dad so my dad started taking me and to my dad's credit when i started training because i had no natural athleticism my childhood asthma I couldn't run around the block. I was the last kid picked in kickball. I mean, you name it. It sounds uh, it's qu- kind of funny because it sounds like you would make it all up because in the West, in America especially, there's like an author, uh, Horatio Alger, who would write stories about kids who go from rags to riches. And it was a popular genre, I think in the late 1800s. So a lot of people like to make up what they call a Horatio Alger story. Like AOC, yeah. for example, is a prominent congresswoman. And she'll say, oh, I grew up poor. Da, da, da. I'm like, no, you didn't. Or I'll meet people who are like, I'm self-made. I'm like, no, you weren't. Like, I like, don't take this from me. Like, I, yeah. I actually, you know, I, I actually know what this is like. You're just you're lying to me. And yeah. I had I had all the numbers hit. So we, you know, we started taking Taekwondo, and it was like fifteen dollars a month or something. So it was quite a bit of money for um for my dad. It was me and him. So I think it was like th- twenty five or thirty dollars a month, and. You know, I, you, I'll, I'll buy a bottle of wine for that now, but then that was like quite expensive. So I just started like training and I wanted to quit. And, you know, he's like, you can't quit because it sucks when you're not athletic. Mm-hmm. And you're throwing, you know, Taekwondo is obviously not BJJ, but when you're a kid, like it's pretty like rigorous. I think a lot of people, martial arts got a bad name after UFC won. Mm-hmm. because you realize, okay, like if you, one guy knows Taekwondo, one guy knows BJJ, like you're just getting steamrolled and that's the end of it. But if you do train and the flexibility, like I could kick face high, but you know, round, you, you know, you name it, you know? So if you're doing, if you're doing head kicks and training to get that level, you're, you're training hard. And I, you know, I didn't have the athleticism and you did that old school martial arts stuff where you're, you know, they train, you're, you're always in a hot room. So you feel like you're about to pass out the whole time and mm-hmm. all that like key stuff. And <laughs> anyway, it was hard, dude. <laughs> so I, yeah. I, I, I was like, man, I'm, and I'm, I'm like, man, I'm going to quit. And my dad, you know, didn't let me quit to his credit. And then I started to get like pretty good. And 
then you realize like, okay, so I'm actually getting pretty good. And you start to get like a certain hardness to you. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, so your physical game gets up and then you, you, then your mental game changes because you're still afraid. Like even to this day, like if somebody tried to start a fight with me, like I would still be afraid. It's a natural, like human response. But I started getting really good and then people would pick fights with me and I just would hit hard. And nice. that, that to some degree changed the arc. But because I grew around such hoodlums in such a poor area, I was pretty much consistently in street fights from third grade to ninth grade. And in, in terms of that, I was like, you know, Hickson was 400 and oh or something. Like, <laughs> I, I was more like, I don't know. Uh, 25 and 14 or something like that. Yeah. But I, I'd, I'd probably been in at least 50 to hundred street fights as a kid. And wow. it w- just, that was where we grew up and that's how the poor people in America live. Sure. And looking back, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you can largely credit this for making you the man you are today, right? Because it forced you to step your game up and, you know, like it's very seldom that someone who comes from, a background that's characterized by privilege and plain sailing ever goes out and does anything great in the world. Yeah, it it does. Um, it, it, in a way it does that either you either become great or you get broken. That's for sure. Mm. Growing mm. up. Cause I hear a lot of people say, Oh, now that I have money and I want my kids to grow up poor because I'm the man I am because I grew up poor and bullied. And I, I could have definitely used, um, a lot less bullying. And I'll tell you why, like you mentioned, you started to bully people and I, you know, I did the same thing where like I bullied a kid in junior high. And to this day, like I think about it, there's not much I think about where I like, I feel bad about myself. Like, wow, you're like, a, that was like a really shitty thing to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And again, in the junior high, you're, you're not aware emotionally of, of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I like bullied a kid. And then I think, well, why? Because I wanted to impress other people, right? Show other people that I was tough. So you're, re- you're reprocessing the trauma and it makes you very, you're, you become emotionally stunted because when you're always in fights, you always got to watch your back. You're not engaging in the kind of social activities that normal people would engage in. So for, I was quite uh, socially stunted in terms of like, well, how do you talk to a person? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was too busy L- literally when I was on fights, dude, I didn't have time to talk to people. And, sure. it, and, and that's not an exaggeration. I could not, it, it feels like satanic because I literally could not go somewhere without somebody trying to start something with me. Sure. Even when I got good, they would gang up on me two or three guys. Right. Mm-hmm. So I got, so I, I go to junior, so I was, I fought my way through grade school and then I go to junior high and now the kids there are big and because of our dumb laws in American education, you would have kids who are 16 years old in eighth grade, right? <laughs> because you can't drop out till you're 16. So I go into junior high, I'm, I don't know, probably 12, 12 or 13, whatever the age is. Mm-hmm. A three or four year age gap is massive at that stage of development. So then I'm getting beat up by these other guys and have to like fight these other guys. I'm like, oh God. So you just can't, you just can't win basically. No, man. Like, <laughs> it, it really is. Like, just leave me alone. Like, how, how am I doing this? So then junior high, I get in a fight with a kid who was kind of like the second command of local hoodlums. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever seen the movie Stand By Me? Yeah, of course. Okay. Love it. So they were, you know, there's the nice kids and then there's like the older brothers, the hoodlums. Yeah. Keeper Sutherland is the older brother, the main older brother, right? Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. So that was what it was like in sort of poor rural white America is you would just have groups of like hoodlums and you wouldn't get shot or anything, but you, you know, you would get beat up, but they wouldn't take a baseball bat to your head or something. But it's that level of like hoodlums were like, yeah, you're going to get beat up. You just can't go places. You're going to get beat up. So I had to fight the second in command. And we, so we fought to a stalemate. And then after I fought this guy to the stalemate, then the, like, the, the chief hood is trying to fight me. And, I, and at the time I was like, I'm not going to fight you. Like you would just really beat me up. It wouldn't even be a challenge. And the person would still like try to fight me. And I thought, what a, no, I'm, I'm telling you like right now there's no fight. And then I was like walking home, five people following me. And then some Jeez. adult comes in and breaks it up. So that was where I lived. Like people would just follow me. I no. couldn't do anything. And then, but then I got, but then developmentally, I got much uh, tougher. So then in seventh grade, 
by, by the time eighth grade ro- rolled around, like I was pretty formidable, at least in terms of, um, you know, street fighting or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then the guy who started a fight with me when I got into junior high, I decided, I don't know if, what people call now, but I was like, I'm going to punk this guy out. So I got word because you learn how people gossip and try to, you know, the kind of people who try to get fights. So I learned that if you thought people were your friends and you're like, oh, I think I could beat that guy up. He'll go tell that guy, oh, he's talking shit or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I want to fight this guy again. I have unfinished business with him. And I go, hey, I think I could beat up this guy. I I forget his, I remember his name, but I'm not going to say it. Mm -hmm. So then I knew where it would get to him. And then I'm walking and he goes, heard you're talking shit, right? So he wants to, because now it's like, this is like prison rules. You learn that if (laughs) I read a lot of like books on, I like the unusual lives. So I like to read about, you know, serial killers and people who Mm -hmm. are in prison or people who even live on like an aircraft carrier. Like, what is it like to just live that bizarre life? Okay. And what you realize now that the reason respect matters when you're poor is because you don't have money. So if you disrespect another poor person, it's the same way in prison, but to the nth degree, you don't have really anything else other than respect. Mm-hmm. So this guy comes up. He's like, heard you talking shit. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Let's go. And he goes, heard you talking shit. Because then he's like freaking out. I'm okay. like, yep, I am. He goes, I heard you talking shit. I'm like, I'm like, you, let's do it right now, bitch. And then he walked away. And so that was like, I, I tied that up. And then... One guy, I think when I was in fifth grade, he beat me up so bad. Because these guys are eighth graders on fifth graders, too. That's what <laughs> yeah. I think what Stand By Me captures so well is three or four years is huge. Mm-hmm. So this fifth grader beat me up so bad that, or the eighth grader did, that my sister had to pull him off. And I like literally cried myself to sleep. Like that was an ass beating. Mm-hmm. And they like, you know, you're getting your head pounded in or whatever. And then I decided, I think this is around ninth grade, that I had to <laughs> avenge that loss. <laughs> So I put word out that I think that I could beat this guy up. And then this guy comes over to my house. It's very, um, it, it sounds <laughs> fake. You know, when you tell these stories, cause they almost sound like too much like story arc, but I think as a young guy, cause I did have a pretty, pretty high IQ, like staging and everything. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to fight this guy. So I mm-hmm. want to put the word out. And then he comes into my front yard. I kid you not. There are 30 kids there. Everybody's <laughs> going to watch him beat me up. No, it was a show. And this is pre-smartphone era and everything. So I call my dad. I'm like, okay, dad, this guy is um, in my yard. He goes, call the police. I'm like, I'm not going to call the police, dad. He said, don't go out there and fight him. I said, I'm not going to. I said, I'm just going to go out there, man. So he sent my uncle. And these people work at junkyards. <laughs> so my uncle and a guy who works at the junkyard were just going to come kind of like referee it. <laughs> so they come over. They pull up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just, <laughs> I mean, it's bizarre. I, I lived a bizarre life for sure. And so they come over and they're going to like referee it. And they're like, don't waste your time, kids. If you're going to fight, fight. If you're not, leave us alone. Uh-huh. And then the, the guy who was, that was going to fight, everyone's like, oh yeah, kick his ass or whatever. So we go out on the road and he has a cigarette. And cause again, you're like 14 year old smoking a cigarette. Uh, that's, that was the culture, right? This is, it's a completely you, when you live in like a middle class or upper middle class life, you're like, what are people doing at 14 smoking? Well, you don't get supervised by your parents. Like you just do whatever you want to do. And if you grew up poor, you, you go that way. So I go, take your cigarette out. So he takes it out and I just front snap kick him and the knee. And he's got no idea. what He's just, so he bends down to hit his knee. And I start mm-hmm. blasting his face. And then he runs away down the alley. I thought, okay, I got, everybody. and then everybody was like mortified, like what happened? But then the same people who were telling him, oh yeah, I kick his ass, this is going to be great. Then they all want to like be my friend. They're like, good yeah. job, man. That was amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, I hate all of you people. Even at that age, um, yeah. eighth or ninth grade level, I had enough emotional awareness to just be, I hate you all. I'm not, we're not friends. This isn't cool. So yeah. I, I ended up being because of that environment where I didn't want to hang out with hoodlums. And I didn't want to hang out with people who they want to shake your hand. It's like a mob. They want to shake your hand after you beat up the guy that they were, you know, their local champion. Mm-hmm. I just was completely isolated and outcast because I just realized I just had a very pessimistic view of human behavior and people. And rightfully so. I mean, a few things come to mind while you're relating that story. The first is that I once was speaking to a psychologist about it and I said, why are kids so fucking mean? Because they are, man. Kids are really, really mean. 
And she said it's because their brains literally haven't finished forming properly. You know, you it's it's my understanding that the brain develops from the inside out, and so the deep reptilian part of your brains are more active and more developed as you're a kid, and those are the parts that are associated with dominance and hierarchy and the pecking order. And then as your frontal lobe develops more as you age and you develop reason and you develop control of your emotions, you start to become literally a better person. And it makes sense to me because, you know, or that and the fact that some people have terrible backgrounds. And again, as I said earlier, they're, they're paying this energy forward. And I'm really sorry you had to go through that, Mike. I'm just glad, um, I'm glad you're cool now. And it, it ties into something else that I think you and I have touched on this before. And I don't want to offend you when I, when I say this, but you, you seem like a, a pretty thick skinned guy. And, and I, I know you'll, you'll take it the right way. And I, but you know when you were going through that 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 uh, that time of, over the past few years in in the political scene and you were it just seemed to me that you were always there was always some kind of conflict around you you know and I'm sure it's not it's not news to you I mean this is what you're known for it was like I, I kind of I was speaking to to my wife about it and we were discussing you and and we we both were like asking like is it just this energy that he acquired early on and at a young age of like he was bullied and now now he's carrying the big stick you know now he's got an audience and now people are listening to him and now he's decided he wants to to turn it on back against the system you know and and uh, do you think there's some truth to that no i think there's a lot of truth in that i through um i don't really no fault of my own i wasn't bullied by choice i just developed a um, high conflict kind of personality where um and you got to realize too most of the people i would get into it with the media would lie about it completely these are bullies mm. um, there's no question that the kind of things happening online with members of the media they really are a psychopathic bullies that's why when you mentioned the conversation with the psychologist and why are kids so mean I don't think that people age out of that. Mm. People are still very nasty. It's just harder for them to get away with it because we live in such a, you know, integrated woven society mm -hmm. that if you act out, you're going to have repercussions. And most of the people, I would say 99% of the people I got into were just nasty people. They were nasty to other people. And then they got into it with me. And then, oh, then there would be a victim. Same thing would happen when I'd fight a guy you know, they would, uh, one guy tried to go to the police after he started fighting. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're like, and, and you know, this, this is why I don't street fight with people. You, you, it's not like you beat a guy up fair one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano. And then it's like the movie son of a gun, the good fight. Good. You know, we'll be friends. Yeah. 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 No, they'll either come back with a baseball bat or they'll go to the police or try to sue you or something like that. Sure. And so, I mean, it was large, it was largely you. I mean, I get it, it was largely you standing up for yourself and and just not tolerating bullying coming in your direction. I just it always seemed to me when I when I saw what you were going through and what you were doing, it just seemed so exhausting to me as an outsider looking in. I just I just thought, man, isn't it isn't it tiring like fighting with people all the time? Sure, it is. Is absolutely, but it was a it was a different life and there a lot, most of the fights people started with me at least. They would like target me. They would just lie about me. You're like, this is, you know, having repercussions on my life, um, complete and total just lies, frauds about me. And I'm not going to be on the internet. Oh, poor me. You know, they're bullying me or whatever. I'm like, okay, this is, this is how it's going to be. Then that's how it's going to be. Now in terms of being exhausting, sure. Like psychologically, I mean, Jordan Peterson was in a video recently, uh, literally crying because the internet has broken him. Twitter has broken him. It was in a way kind of sad most people would definitely, if they'd gone through like what I'd gone through and even to the extent of deal with, they would be completely broken. Almost nobody could go through what I go through. But to me, that's it's almost like uh, your, your youth, your, your childhood, that incredibly difficult childhood prepared you for that and almost immunized you against it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've done hard things like basic training. I've trained rigorous martial arts. Um, you know, BJJ, your body just hurts all the time. That's why I quit training and I was just tired of like limping all the time. Yeah. And yeah. people, when you're kind of like the cult of BJJ, everybody's like, oh yeah, that's normal, man. And I'm like, no, it's not normal. No, it's not normal. It's yeah. Not, <laughs> it's yeah, no, yeah. It's just not good for you. <laughs> exactly. Right. So Mike, um, yeah, I mean, I'm so happy to hear that because 
you know, I'd always look at these things and I, I didn't really follow all that stuff too much, but you know, I was, you know, wanting, to, we didn't, we weren't really speaking much cause you were so busy and I just was following your life a little bit. And I'd, every now and then I'd see an article or a thing and I'd just be like, to me, I just felt this, I, 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 since I met you, I always knew you were a person with a good heart. I always knew that instantly. I was like, this guy's got a good heart. And a part of me just thought like, you know, it just made me sad to see that you were surrounded, surrounded by so much conflict. And I was like, I just always thought, you know, you're better than this, man. You don't need to fucking fight with these people. Like, but I, I kind of get why you did it now. And I understand it to a degree. I'm just glad you've, you've moving yourself away from that world. Sure. And, but, but one thing to you, I think you would have to concede is like, you know, me, you've known me for years and you read these articles about me, like that's it's just lies. Mm. And it's kind of like, what do you do when people are, you know, they're saying you're racist? It's like, no, I mean, it's just objectively not true. Or, or even little things like they would say that, oh, you know, um, you know, Cernovich is freaking out. He started doing like ayahuasca. And I'm like, no, that I did that with Nick five years ago. I just hadn't posted the article. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they, they lie about everything from they call you you know, they label you these things to try to destroy your life to even basic biographical details. Like I had done five MEO DMT seven years ago. I done ayahuasca four or five years ago with you in South Africa. Mm -hmm. They just, they just lie about everything. And yeah, yeah. In, in a way we are, you know, replaying our childhood in many ways. So when people do that and they're lying about me, I'm not, I'm not just going to, to cry about it. Over and take it. Yeah. You know, Fuck that. No, I, I agree with you, man. I totally agree with you. So, Mike, let's talk a little bit about um, your book, which I absolutely loved, called Gorilla Mindset. I think that there's so much value in that for, for the modern man. And as you know, is aimed primarily at men. Uh, I think that men are very disenfranchised um, in the modern world and that a lot of them are very unhappy and, and searching. And I think with with enough tools that can massively improve the quality of their lives. And I think that Gorilla Mindset is one of those tools. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came up with the idea for the book and also why you included the material in there that you did? Yeah, the book came about through real life experience. I was never into... So the, the book came about... For, the, the process is obviously much longer. I released it in my, I think, mid to late 30s. Mm -hmm. And I had been just trying to figure things out because I grew up in that bullied environment where I was kind of socially stunted. So I read books like, you know, how to win friends and influence people, how to stop worrying and stop living, all these other books to try to figure out like what is happening, how to process it. Because you don't learn that in life or in school where people say, oh, you know, why do you feel that way? Well, you probably feel that way because of this. Or have you considered that you might feel that way because of that? There's no no guidebook to your own um, inner life or inner game. And there had been different kinds of it. So for example, if you were a little bit socially awkward, you know, there was the, that book, the game or whatever that sold like 20 million copies, mm -hmm. but that's just like one little part. It's like, okay, you want to meet girls. That's like, cool. But I mean, everybody who's straight, you know, obviously wants to, but what if you want to live like a fully integrated, emotionally conscious, high productive, high success life where success is defined on your terms as you want to define it. Okay. And there was no book like that. That's why I set out to, to write the book about it. And we cover everything from negative thought patterns, negative emotional patterns, where these thought patterns come from, how to change the direction and momentum of the thought patterns. And even there's a chapter on money, which I almost didn't include, but it turned out to be almost the most popular chapter because you realize most people have never learned any kind of money mindset. And that included me. I didn't know anything about money. I would just make it and spend it. Yeah. And you, you know, just like, oh, I have money. Cool. Spend it. Oh, sh I don't have money now. Okay. Now I have money. Cool. And that was, again, the you, your time preference when you grow up poor is a little bit different because money is like so scarce. So mm -hmm. I always think of like money is scarce. And then you realize, no, I mean, money is actually abundant. If you learn how to attract it, learn how to focus on it. How to manage it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. There's um, one of the spiritual teachers whose work I'm a big fan of, uh, John F. D. Martini, he said, 
you either become the master of money or you remain its slave. And that always stuck with me. And it's obvious that the stuff you outline in Guerrilla Mindset is designed to help you move from slave to master, which I think any man who needs, who's seeking liberation and actualization, which I think is pretty much everyone listening to this show, it's, it's money is a big part of that puzzle, a very big part of that puzzle, because you're not free if you're a, a wage slave wearing a name tag, doing something you hate, right? That's as far from freedom as pretty much anything can be. And it's the underlying stress too. the, you know, knowing that you're one job loss away from something or one, one paycheck away from catastrophe, mm-hmm. that underlying stress is always there, which is again, why I think poor people are, you know, worse to each other in many ways. A lot of people say, oh, rich people are the worst. I, I don't know. I've known a lot of rich people, middle-class people. And I've known a lot of poor people. And I would think poor people are, tend to be worse to each other. And it isn't because they're bad people. It's because they're constantly, their baseline level of stress, if you're broke, if you have no money, your baseline level of stress is going to be like a four or a five. Mm-hmm. Whereas if your money is like on point, your money's kind of set, you're still going to have stress and we're all living the human condition. But your your baseline level of stress is going to be maybe like a two. For sure. Uh, it reminds me of a, another saying, which is, um, well, it's a quote, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he said, uh, there have been times when I've been poor and, and unhappy and times when I've been rich and unhappy. And the times when I was poor and unhappy were way, way worse. And I think there's some truth to that. I mean, yeah, we're all going to have troubles and issues in life, but it's definitely easier when you have money, right? Yeah, because yeah. I've, I've, I've been both. You're living yeah. proof. Right? If yeah, I've, 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 I've been both. And I, I don't have a lot of patience for people who they, they like glamorize poverty or something like that. I'm like, okay, sure. you can... Or money, money doesn't matter. I'm like, okay, when rich people, there's just things people do that, that maybe trigger me. One is that if you're rich and you're like, money doesn't matter. It's like, okay, give up all your money then. Well, sure. what do you mean? Well, it doesn't buy <laughs> happiness. It doesn't matter. Go donate it all to charity or something. Yeah. I just really hate, like for me, I can deal with evil if it's honest evil. I can deal with stupidity even if it's honest stupidity. But when people who are rich say things like that, I really can't handle it. Yeah, it reminds me of, I think I've referenced this on the show before, but there's a one of my favorite movies. And if you haven't watched it, if you're listening, please watch it. It is an incredibly powerful film. It's called The Aviator by Martin Scorsese, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, based on the life of the magnate slash aviator, Howard Hughes. And he's dating this woman who comes from old money, who lives um, in New York with her, her wealthy family. And he goes to their family's house for lunch. And the mother is very condescending towards him. And she, she makes some comment along the lines of, well, money isn't important, dear. And he just looks at her and goes, that's because you have some. And to me, that was the most powerful scene in the whole film. And it kind of ties into what you're saying. You know, it's very easy to say money isn't important when you have some. Yeah, yes. It's easy and it's glib. And it's not helpful. And in quite it's actually quite counterproductive because a lot of people – are going to, if you're in a position to give advice where your opinion matters, then you you have a responsibility to give people good 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 advice, or at the very least, not give them bad advice. Mm-hmm. And if you're telling people, oh yeah, money doesn't matter, da 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 da, you're giving people bad advice because then they might think, oh okay, I don't need to worry about money. And th- like one of the focal points of Gorilla Mindset is, you ne- yes, you do. You need to go make money. This is not optional. This is something you should view as a major priority in your life. Even if you want to be, you know, spiritual and emotional, the, the money is always going to help. And if, uh, and if you make the money and you realize, hey, I don't, I'm not into money, you can always give it away. Sure. Exactly right. You know, there's a strange thing in the West. I think it's got to do with the puritanical belief systems or the remnants of them at least, which is that spirituality and poverty are... It, it, like intr- intrinsically interwoven um, and that to be spiritual you have to be poor but you know funny enough in the east it's the exact opposite a lot of the, the the monks are extremely wealthy and you know they have nice cars and they they have m- nice homes and money and it's never there's never an issue with that in the east i mean why and the more i think about it the more i think there's some truth to that like why why is it a good idea to be to be broke if you're spiritual i mean spirituality if if it works if it's functional spirituality it helps your life on the material plane get better not worse and that's one of the first ways you can tell whether a cult or like a religion is bullshit or not is like does it does it make your life better or worse your actual physical life and you know it's obvious that money makes 
up to a point makes people's lives better. So why would you follow a spiritual teaching that, that claimed the opposite? It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But people have to learn that um, often, you know, the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that, yeah, that's, that's the only way people, most people learn lessons. Mike, I have two more questions for you. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation uh, just partly because we're just catching up and I don't, I don't get to see you and catch up as much as I want to, but also because you, you've been dropping some real wisdom here. I wanted to ask you, what have you been wrong about? Uh, let's say over the last five years, if you look back at Mike from five years ago when I met you and you look at the Mike of today, what was the Mike from back then wrong about? What can you identify? Oh, I mean, a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is I was dumb to not monetize my website when it was big. I was, you know, I thought I was like, oh yeah, you know, don't, don't sell anything, you know, that's selling out or whatever. I, uh, that was just very stupid. And one of the best things you can do for people is, you know, you have a, you have a product, you have a business and if it's valuable, cause I used to think making money was like unsavory. <laughs> That's how I felt about it. Like, oh, only scammers are trying to sell things on the internet and internet marketing, blah, blah, blah. And sure, there's a lot of scammy internet marketing things. Mm-hmm. But you're, one of the best things you can do is create value and exchange value. So my own unhealthy relationship with business probably cost, not probably, uh, certainly cost me seven figures, which I wasn't doing anybody any favor by not releasing things. And I wasn't doing myself or my family any favors either. So this unhealthy relationship with viewing money is kind of, cause I used to view money as like kind of dirty in a way. Uh-huh. That's and, probably why you never had any back then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have something and, or the, the way rich people are cast in society, we're brainwashed to believe that all the rich people are like, um, there's a famous movie that plays at Christmas every year. It's a wonderful life. Mm-hmm. And you know, the main character is this rich guy, uh, Potter, and he's always taking advantage of people, stealing people. That's the the image that we're primarily have been given when it comes to rich. One of two things. One is hyper consumption. So be a Kardashian, you know, buy a bunch of clothes, da 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 da, hyper consumption, get the Lambo, even if it means spending all your money, or rich people are oppressing everyone, and rich people are the worst people in the world. They're evil. And I, I was just wrong about my relationship with money and business. And it set me back quite a few years. Yeah. Well, I mean, fortunately, you figured it out in the end because some people never do. So good for you, brother. The next thing I wanted to ask you is, I guess this is tied. The answer is probably in Gorilla Mindset, which I encourage everyone to read. But what is what do you believe is the main issue or one of the main issues that face that men today, the modern man is facing? and a potential solution? Um, Self-loathing and hatred, uh, definitely. The same reason I had an unhealthy relationship with money was because of the propaganda that we passively consume. Now that I have a, a, a child, so this segues back to your earlier question about what I was wrong about. I wasn't wrong about the role of propaganda, but I didn't realize how pervasive it is and how it does affect our moods and control and controls our thoughts. I'll give you an example, positive one. We have, you know, we're very um, careful with how much TV and screen time we have a Syrah, but we have her watch very uplifting things. And then Mm -hmm. I'll notice she'll say, Oh, I'm going to, when I do this, I, I I feel proud. And I go, that's a nice life lesson. Where'd you learn that? Well, she learned it from like Daniel Tiger's adventure (laughs) where they're like, try, try. They have these little songs they sing along with. And it's actually quite (laughs) inspiring and uplifting. (laughs) <laughs> we gotta watch it. She's yeah. like, wow, I did it, Daddy. I feel proud. I'm like, wow, that's that's amazing. But you got to realize too that they're being programmed by what they're watching, and all of us are being programmed consciously and unconsciously by what we're watching and what we're being told. Sure. And we were we were programmed money's bad, and now men are being programmed. Men are bad. Toxic masculinity is bad. If you go to the gym, you're a gym bro loser. What do you got? Like a little dick complex. You want a cool car probably because you're overcompens. Everything's negative mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. about men. And because of that, men feel very dissonant where they have desires and aspirations, but they're afraid to seek those desires and aspirations because they would feel like that would somehow make them evil. Sure. Uh, you know, so to keep it on a superficial level, we can always go deeper is I was, once I got that brainwashing out of my head, 
I was never afraid to admit like, you know what? I want to drive a cool car and have a hot girlfriend and I want to mm-hmm. date a lot of hot chicks. I just admitted sure. that. But it, but if you say that, you're going to be like, oh, what kind of douchebag is that? You want to date? Well, every man wants to date hot chicks. Every mm-hmm. man, you know, if you're straight, every man wants to have like the cool car. I don't anymore because I've had it. So I got mm-hmm. it out of my system. But if you say, yeah, I just want to drive a cool car and date hot chicks, you're now a douchebag. And so because of that messaging, men are paralyzed. They, they don't want to seek out what they know they want because they feel like that's somehow bad. And that's because the propaganda is so strong. And that's where men are a mess. Men are afraid to fully embrace and integrate their masculine will. Yeah, interesting. It's tied, It's very much tied to, I mean, that particular scenario you you explained, it's, it's men generally are being influenced by the opinion of women or, or feminists or whoever you want to categorize by. But I think it's, it's deeper than that. I think it ultimately comes down to getting to a place within yourself where the only opinion that truly matters is your own, right? Not, not your father's or the priest's or the political figures or your social circle. It's ultimately you. You're the captain of your own ship. You're the one who's going to be on your deathbed one day looking back at your life. It's not the feminist or your brother or your boss or the guys on Facebook. It's you have to to be the one um, to decide how you're going to live. I think that's very important. Yeah, it is. But you before you can even get there, you have to go through a whole load of, you, you know, you've been programmed. You're essentially running defective software in your mind. Mm, mm. And most people, you have to admit that first because the software, everybody's miserable. I, I mean, that's what I love about the, you know, the brainwashing is that women now, one in four are on antidepressants. When I, when I say that, people don't believe it. And I'm always like, just Google it. I mean, you can, this is reputable. This is a CDC. This is not Mike Cernovich telling you this. Mm-hmm. So women, women are unhappy because they want men to be more masculine. Men are unhappy and confused because they feel like acting on their masculine impulses, which is to create, to do great things. If you're a man, you're, it's embedded in your DNA that there's some element of male heroism. The, you want to do something heroic. Men sacrifice themselves for other people. Men will jump on a hand grenade for other people. And other people say, well, women do that too. Women sacrifice for their children. But if you just look in the world of empiricism, the, the self-sacrifice is primarily a male character. And that's because ma- male heroism, men want a legacy where mm-hmm. you know, women think much less about their legacy and whatnot, their, or their children are their legacy. Mm-hmm. So if you're a man and you're not doing anything heroic, unconsciously, your mind knows something is wrong. Your mind knows that you're not living right. And you feel like garbage And then you turn to drugs, alcohol, video games, other addictive substances, and people need to just embrace it and say, I want to do something heroic. And it's okay because here's what happens to people. I mean, I remember not to be too crass, but I was programmed with some very um, heavy religious software growing up. And because of that, like I would not even, you know, if I would have sex, I have premarital sex, I felt like a deep feeling of shame. Mm -hmm. And now I kind of laugh at it, but when you're programming, you're running that software, the software is telling you to do something wrong. So if you're a man and you're thinking, you know what? I'm going to do something fucking epic. I want to do something heroic. I want to do some legacy shit. Well, if you're me or you, we're like, hell yeah, man, fucking A, you know, the badass. But if you're 90% of men, you're like, oh, what a douche. You know, and you even, if you, if you say that out loud, it's a good way actually kind of a test for men to see what kind of software they're running is, if you say, man, I want to do something fucking epic. And if you feel weird after you say that, then your software is fucked up. And yeah. you need to take, take that software out. You need to reinstall a, a better operating system. And of course, women too. If women want to do something heroic, that's great for them. But women are told they can do anything. It isn't, it isn't women who aren't being told they can't do anything. Women are told they can do everything. Men are now being told that anything they want to do is sinful. And you realize now that the religion that we were all programmed with has been changed now to a secular religion, but it's every bit as pernicious and controlling and mind consuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very powerful insights there, Mike. And I agree with you on almost all points, man. Um, 
in fact, pretty much all of them. Brother, what a what a great honor and pleasure it is to to have you on the show, and, and yet yeah, more great pleasure just to talk to you. I forget how how enjoyable our conversations are. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon in LA. But for the people listening who want to find out more about you and your new projects and the things you're doing, I know you've got a great new nootropic formula out there called Gorilla Mind, which I have yet to try, but I'm hopefully going to pick some up from you this weekend. Where where should they go to find out more about you and your? Oh yeah, the best place is just go to because I have so many things going on that people who even follow me don't even know what I have going on. So mm-hmm. Sarvich.com is like the portal for I have podcasts and streams and book reviews and I mean on that site, I mean I have everything from podcasts with you about martial arts to breaking news. It's all there. C E R N O V I C H dot com is the place to go. Got it. Got it. I'll be sure to put it on the the Uh, episode page. Mike, brother, thank you so much for your time. It's greatly appreciated. Always a pleasure, Nick. Thank you. I absolutely loved that episode. You know, Mike and I, we were developing quite a close friendship several years ago and then he kind of got famous and went off and did this whole political thing and we drifted apart and I was kind of down about it. And then we reconnected a few months ago, which is really great for me and i was really happy about that so it was great to have this this call because i've been wanting to share him with you guys for a long time you know mike he's got many detractors online and many people who he's, he's very misunderstood and i know he's a real guy he's real there's no other way to put it you know he i'm sure he's very opinionated and there's certain things that you might not agree with but he's not faking anything this is who he is you know you he he shows you the real the real part of himself and you know that's becoming a common theme now this in in self-help circles and in uh, social media like people are being vulnerable now right but you know a lot of them are just jumping on the bandwagon uh, and they're just doing it for attention and a lot of them are faking it as well and you can't say it about mike mike has always been real he's always been like this is me this is these are my flaws. These are my insecurities. This is what I had to overcome. This is who I am. If you don't like it, fuck you. And I absolutely love that about him. That's one of the ways I'm living my life now. It took me 40 years to figure this out, but you know, I'm not apologizing for anything anymore. Obviously within reason, if I do something wrong that hurts someone, you know, I'm going to apologize for it, but I'm not apologizing for anything to do with who I am. You know, like I, I am who I am and you take it or leave it and since i've adopted that mindset it's just made such a difference to everything it's uh it's a really powerful attitude to adopt in life you know if certain relationships have fallen away certain things in my business have changed my social circle has changed everything's changed since i adopted that that attitude it's like i'm not out to impress anyone you know i don't need anyone's approval except my own and i'm not apologizing for who i am take it or leave it and that's something that Mike has really helped me with in my life and one of the reasons I appreciate and love the guy. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Remember, if you want to have a conversation with me about your life and where it's going and how to take it to the next level, you can head on over to liberationmental.com and book a free call with me or apply for a free call with me. I don't take everyone, but um, there's no obligation and uh, I think you'll find it very illuminating on many levels. So I look forward to chatting to you guys soon and tune in next week for another episode. Until then, love and light.